You know, George Washington had Martha, Franklin Roosevelt had Eleanor, John Kennedy had Jackie, Pat Nixon stood by her husband every step of the way. Now we see Betty Ford and Rosalind Carter actively campaigning for their husbands in the presidential election. Each of these politicians has had the physical presence and emotional support of his wife throughout his career. These women have stood by their husbands, sometimes bearing the brunt of their mistakes, always having to be cautious about what they say and being forced to revoke their right to privacy. I'm Marie Torrey, your host this afternoon on Woman to Woman. Join us as we explore the grueling but exciting life of a woman in politics as we talk with Lenore Romney, who has been a prominent political wife and who in 1970 was a candidate for the United States Senate. Also, we'll be talking with her daughter-in-law, Rana. Please join us. We talked about political wives, Mrs. Romney. I have to say that uh, you have been, in a sense, uh, through the mill, having been, uh, prior to a political wife, a corporate wife, which uh, has its own set of circumstances and, and uh, problems. How do you, do you feel any of the worse for wear after these two experiences? Well, I tell you, um, I've had a great experience because I've had a good husband. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. It's been exciting to do the things with him that he's done. It was fun being with American Motors. We had our bad days when we were in the black, uh, before we were in the black, when, when we were in the red. But we've also had uh, great experiences in politics. I would not be one of those who would say that it's all difficult. Some of it is, of course. But if you have a goal, and if you both believe in um, the goal out there, you're willing to do a lot of things that you wouldn't do otherwise, to reach that goal. And I mean not for you, but for the ideals that you have. You say you've had a good husband. What constitutes a good husband? Someone who says, if you have a brain, use it. You don't have to worry about what I'll think about what you say. <laughs> Go out and be yourself. You're, you're an individual. You're a person. This is, this is how he has reacted to you, to what me. he believes. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, well now there have been, so while we're quoting others, there have been others who have said that uh, you're the one in the, in the Romney household who should have been in politics. I tried it. I tried it. I ran for Senate and I found that my husband was really um, very adept, very, uh, well, he was a straight arrow. I don't think we're always ready for straight arrows, but my husband was one of those who said what he thought. That got him in trouble in national politics. It didn't here in Michigan. Michigan, they needed someone who would speak out. We were uh, in the red when he took over. We weren't paying our teachers and so on when he became governor. But in national politics, people couldn't understand that a person could be as open and as frank as my husband was, and therefore they thought he must have ulterior motives. Well, okay, well, we're talking about, you know, the openness and the frankness. Um, the time, going back to that notorious time when he mentioned about being brainwashed with respect to Vietnam, uh, there was a good deal of criticism. Oh, and the country just, uh, you know, exploded. I think a lot of it was uh, the media, pardon me, but I do. Well, <laughs> and I yet in Vietnam me. they said, you're absolutely right when he said uh, that they were brainwashing the people that went over. They were telling them we were not going to send in our troops. They were telling them that it was going to be over in a few months and so on. When uh, George got over there and then when he got back he said, why, it's a brainwash deal, you know, and he was right. The whole country was being brainwashed. He find that, found well, that... Well, uh, but he was closer than the whole country, you see, to, to the situation. Uh, some people thought that uh, it uh, showed he was perhaps naive to, to have believed what he did and then, and then have said what he did. Well, he was believing the President of the United States. The President told him we were not sending in Well, some people troops. believed Richard Nixon, too. Yes, but all I'm saying is that when he found that... It, that that was not right. He said, I wish they brainwashed me and it wasn't right and we're, we shouldn't be in that war. What did that cost him politically? Well, it cost him uh, a lot. I don't know exactly whether that alone would have uh, defeated him. But anyway, it cost him uh, at that time his advantage in the polls, let's say. Mm. Well, now, both of you have not experienced what you would call uh, you know, salad days in, in, in politics. I mean, you've both tried to, to, to reach for a certain goals and you've not succeeded, neither one of you. 
Uh, is there any, any bitterness, resentment? Uh, why, what happens when you try for something and uh, you're not recognized for what well, you're trying well, to do? Um, I don't, I, I don't quite buy that because I think in Michigan, uh, yes, he didn't actually go into politics thinking he would be governor. He went in to get a new constitution, Citizens for Michigan, new tax reform. He became governor and the things that he was working for, tax reform, income tax, uh, open housing, uh, a strong civil rights uh, plank and so on, he did get these things. He got most of the things that he was working for. He left um, the state political scene to go to Washington because he saw a lot of problems that weren't being solved in the state housing, for instance, and urban problems. And he thought maybe on the national level he could be more useful. But I would say that a lot of the things that he did work for and believed in were accomplished. While but he, he ran for a presidential nomination and didn't get it. You ran for the U.S. Senate well, and you didn't Well, you don't get them all, but, but he did get, well, even now he has the, uh, the satisfaction of knowing he was right. He was right. He was speaking way? out on, on the Vietnam War. Yeah, but that's gone now, isn't it? That's gone, but the people will always remember that man was right. They'll you remember, see what I they'll mean? remember he said brainwashed, wouldn't they? They'll remember that, and they'll remember that they were brainwashed more than he, much more. They, they waited much longer than he did mm -hmm. to admit it. <laughs> Ron, is, is it tough being in a family where, where politics is uh, so dominant and uh, the fact that you're not involved in politics, nor your husband, does this make it tough? Well, I don't think politics are dominant in our family. No more? No, they never have been. The dominant thing in our family has been being a family. That's been the number one thing. And politics has been a very interesting, exciting, mind-opening experience. We have really enjoyed it. Uh, we've campaigned successfully when Scott's father ran for governor. We campaigned unsuccessfully when he ran for the presidency and when Mom ran for the Senate. But in each of those cases, it was a wonderful experience. We did things that most people our age never get a chance to, to do. We saw things that most people our age never get a chance to see. And we considered it a great experience. If it was so great, then why didn't you or, or Scott become involved in politics? Because I, the one thing I learned, mm -hmm. th I, and it really made a, a great impact upon me, was the fact that you had to be prepared to go into politics. You have to have done your homework. You can't say as a young man or a young woman, let's go into politics. You have to be prepared financially. You have to understand what's happening. I don't think it's right that these people leave college and then just go into politics. You have to know a little bit about the things that you're passing laws about. Maybe someday we will, but right now we're not ready. Mm -hmm. They're very young, you know. We have a family what to raise. What are you trying to say? <laughs> this is wrong with the naive, too, or what? <laughs> no, no, I'm saying that uh, let them have some groundwork, let them get preparation, and then decide what they, whether yeah, okay. someday they want to get well, into politics. They're, okay, we're, we're going to take a break, but when we return, perhaps, um, Mrs. Romney, you might address yourself to, to uh, some of the uh, drawbacks in politics, such as what could happen to a Martha Mitchell, for example, right, she having right. been a close friend of yours. Back in just a few moments. I, was, I usually ask the questions here, but, but Mrs. Uh, Lenora Romney has asked me uh, to clarify something. She said, what you're saying is that unless you win, you should not try in, uh, in politics. Um, I guess I wasn't saying that so much as, as um, you know, how can you stay in politics if the attempts you do make to achieve something do not pan out? Well, when you go in, you know that they may not. There's a 50-50 chance there. You may Isn't win. Isn't that feeling of rejection, <laughs> though? Don't you feel um, I'm rejected? <laughs> no. No, I don't think you feel that so much because, again, as Rhonda said, you have, your fa you have the basic things yeah. in your life. This is something that you believe in and you hope you can make a contribution. But if you can't, you don't feel the whole thing's been a failure. I mean, if someone says, no, thank you, at least you've tried. I can say to my kids when they say, Mother, where were you when our state was having problems, when our country was having some real social and human problems, where were you? I can say I was in there trying. That's I was pointing important. out the That's social important. and human errors and addressing mm -hmm. myself to them. 
and at a time when we were paying ADC mothers if they their husbands had left them but not if their husbands were with them you know yeah. all sorts of things like this I felt we were very wrong in the the approach we had to welfare I felt we were very wrong mm -hmm. what we were doing to make our children disinherited spiritually and emotionally I worked on these things if I couldn't get that across I was sad but it was up to the voters I gave them a choice see mm. Well, when you, when you want to think about a negative, negative side of politics, of course, you think of a Martha Mitchell, uh, right. who was a good friend of yours, I understand. Right. And, you know, if someone had said to me, said to me, how about, how about a pairing of friends, Martha Mitchell and Eleanor Romney, I'd say, <laughs> oh, this is an impossible combination. Uh, you, were, you, of course, must have had tremendous insight into what she experienced. Right. Martha was the sort of person that was very... Ha was happy to be with her. You were happy to be with her. She was bubbling. She was effervescent. She loved life. She had a very happy life with John Mitchell when she was in Washington. She, they adored their daughter. She talked a lot about her son who was in the Vietnam War. And um, Martha had a good time. And then all of a sudden she was, you know, on the top. The boom was low but, suddenly. But all, well, first she was given all of this adulation because she spoke out. And she really was uh, uninhibited, as you know. And then after they put her up there, as you say, the boom was lowered and uh, she saw things as they really were and she became um, very, very frantic. About the stories of the shots that were given to her. That was by, true. By FBI. And, uh, that was true. It was horrible stories. A horrible story. That Absolutely. That was true. Well, how'd you sit by and let that happen? Well, I didn't. I called, you do? I called John Mitchell. I called... I did but everything if he was her husband, he had no awareness of what was going on. I mean, wasn't He did of... know it was going on. I talked to him and he said he'd stop it and he'd stop all of these things that... Well, sh they were afraid that she was, uh, oh, maybe going to be institutionalized and that maybe she needed to be, which she didn't. But she did need some attention and some love and some understanding. And she all I did it. was give her a, f a friendly ear. You know, she called it when she said some of the things that were going on. At the she White did not House, know about. She, uh, she did not know about Watergate. She called it because she saw things going on that she did not like. She was right, but as far as Watergate, she saw that in the paper. That was the first time she. Yeah, saw but she that. knew that there were things that that could lead to a Watergate, and well, this is. That's right. We we had to give her, you know, more much more respect than I think she earned in her lifetime. Well, she tried to be honest. She tried to, uh, she mm. told things as she saw them. Does that discourage you, Rhonda, when you hear a story like that? Well, I think from my point of view, which I think is a fairly common point of view from people our age, that we get very discouraged looking at the state that our country's in, the type of politicians that we see representing us. And maybe I'm idealistic, but I think that we should have the very finest representing us in this country. I think our leaders should be the type of people that we can look up to and that the world can look, look up to. And we don't have them today. When well, you we say, do. well, some, we have some, but I think that we see many, many people, many of the politicians today I cannot look up to personally. And it discourages me, and yet it also makes me feel that we must step in and we must try to find people that can lead us and people that we can be proud of, people that will take our ideals and embody them. She's, that's a disillusioned voice, you know. I know it, but I do feel that we have fantastic people in government that are not being given the credit that they deserve. People that are willing to fight that, for the that things is they true. believe in. And that's the sad thing. The people that have these high ideals, many of them do not receive uh, the, the recognition that they deserve. That's okay, you so wouldn't uh, you wouldn't classify then um, Congressman Don Regal as one with what you call the high ideals. No, I wouldn't. Why? Why, why not? <laughs> if what I've read is true, then he's not the man that I would like to represent me because I want someone who has high ideals, somebody who believes as I do that the family is the very backbone, the basic, found, the basic structure in this country. Well, but, but uh, let me just come in here because I think that uh, there's a lot more to Ronald, uh, to Don Regal than we're, than we're um, hearing about because to make a tape in the first place and then to have a, a code name, Prince, and to say you're going to be president, in, I mean, it shows to me an immature person or a playfulness? Or a playfulness. Or a, What's uh, wrong with playfulness, Mrs. Or Ron? A, uh, uh, well, picturing power way up here. Some, to picture yourself in 1980 or something of the kind with someone that you're making a tape with in a situation that you really wouldn't want your 
wife or your constituents to be in on, and, and yet you're taping it. If you don't want it to come out, then why, I think the most personal things on earth today are being made the most impersonal, and I personally resent that. I think the personal things should not be impersonal and should not be flaunted and thrown out and put on well, tape and said to the world, but, uh, this is my life. It's his private life, though, in a sense, isn't it? It could be, but he didn't make it that way. He taped well, it. Yeah, he taped it, but I don't think he expected it to be re revealed by a newspaper. Hmm. Well, if you're running for the United States Senate, and I think this is one of the finest forums in the world, well it is, in the world, right. then I believe that you should, um, that we should expect a person to be a whole person. If you say what you do in your private life has nothing to do with public life, then you get what we get in government sometimes. True, Mrs. Ryan, but aren't you, aren't you measuring him by your own standards? I'm not measuring him. I'm not going to judge him. He, the people are going to have to do that. I'm just saying it seems to me that uh, the whole thing showed an instability. I'm not saying whether he... Well, business, again, by you your know, standards, it showed an instability. By, my, by his standards, it might be a very healthy expression that, that he can take it or leave it in the sense that uh, he has no hang-ups about sex. Uh, that uh, even no, if no, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hang up about sex. Let's get let's get to the basic there. If you have to have a, an affair with when you're married and have a family to show that you have no hang ups about sex, that isn't what I consider a uh, hang up about sex. Mrs. To be faithful, I, maybe I am interpreting my own point of view, but I also believe that if you can't keep your word to the person closest to you, maybe you won't keep your word to somebody else. I do believe what you are in your home, as Rousseau said is what you are, if not to the world, at least to yourself and to your God, what you are. But Mrs. Romney, if you do read some of these uh, studies on, on the sex habits of, uh, of Americans, uh, you'll find that there is an extremely high percentage of married men who do have uh, extracurricular marital uh, uh, affairs. Uh, uh, what's the difference between Congressman Regal and some of these people about whom you never hear? Well, one is that, uh, that Congressman Regal is, is to represent my state, and I'm depending upon his good judgment and his integrity and keeping his word. I'm, I'm, believing, I'm hoping that I have a stable person who will be there when he needs to be there with the right decisions. Okay, well, are you speaking now as a, a member of the Mormon Church or as uh, an American voter? As an American voter. And, I and believe your, as an your American religious voter, ethics have no play no well, part I, in your I'm feeling. I'm sure my uh, religious beliefs have something to do with me because they're wrapped up in the fabric of my being, and my home life, and what I believe in. But I, I think when I went into politics, if my associations were important and they said they were, if decisions I had made were important and they said they were, then I think other things too can be considered important. I think if you say everything you do publicly is important but anything you do in your personal life is not, then I think you're almost saying it's dangerous to have a good public, a personal life. Because you're saying, well, it doesn't matter what on earth you are in your personal life. Throw it out the window because it only matters what you do when you get to the office. Do you cons and, and if this person is going to represent you in government, you want someone that you can depend upon. I'm not just saying this for one candidate or somebody else. I'm just saying this as a principle. I think that the people that represent us in government should be next to the clergyman in integrity because they have so much at stake. If you don't want that, stay out of politics. If he wants all that, you don't have to be where the public eye is on you. But look what they're doing well, to a Roosevelt now. Not, in your not actions. look what they're doing to a Kennedy. Look okay. what they're doing to all these people now, see? Okay, you know what we have to do? We have to, we have to take a break. <laughs> but we'll be back with Lenore Romney and Rana Romney in just a few oh, moments. Mrs. Romney, your, your daughter-in-law, Rana, says that uh, the time is not yet ripe for her husband, your son, to go into politics, but that the right time she looks forward to it. You've been a candidate's wife. Uh, maybe you can uh, tell us what uh, awaits Rana when she becomes a <laughs> candidate's wife. Give us the truth of it, because I have my own ideas having interviewed wives of candidates. Well, I don't know that uh, Scott will ever go into politics, and Rana doesn't either. But let me just say that, they're, uh, that it's grueling and when you're a candidate yourself, it's, um, it's hard 
it's bruising. I had no idea that it was as bruising. I don't mind the physical strain as much as I do the emotional. To see yourself in print as you don't imagine yourself, you know, because you have certain ideas about yourself and then you see yourself depicted differently yeah. and your ideas, um, someone else sees them differently from the way you do. All of these things are very hard. Ron has been close enough to it to understand and she knows the uh, the abuse that you have to be willing to take. Well, as someone who has interviewed wives <laughs> of candidates, Rana, let me tell you something. I, uh, yes. uh, what I would like, um, it seems to me so often that, that uh, when you become a candidate's wife, uh, you're, you suddenly change your whole public uh, demeanor. It's almost as if someone uh, injected you with saccharin or something. Yeah, you but they, they're so sweet and so nice <laughs> and so proper. And uh, you weren't like that, Mrs. Romney. Right? No. <laughs> but um, I've always tried to be myself. And they shake hands with everyone in sight. Uh, we do that then, in church anyway. Then the husband, <laughs> should the husband get an office? They become most difficult to try and find oh, them. Do they? <laughs> when they come in, they don't shake hands with everybody. <laughs> You didn't do this, did you? Uh, no. In fact, the thing I hated was trying to go to a supper where everybody's uh, having chicken and you go around trying to shake hands with them and they want to say, no, thank you. They're all greasy and stuck. And then you say, I'm so-and-so. They couldn't care less who you are. Then you have to tell them what a wonderful person you are. This I hate, you know. Why are you running? Well, I'm running because I'm this and I'm th My mother always taught me not to brag about myself or my family. And here I am saying, my husband's the finest, I'm the best. And it's, it's ridiculous. You know, and, and you go up to tough. strangers. I, one of the funny things was going up to a stranger once, and I said, I'm Lenore Romney, and he said, do you want me to take you out to dinner? <laughs> he had no idea who I was. You said anything but chicken. on the street, and he thought that I was, <laughs> this was many years ago. So uh, there are a lot of pitfalls, you know, and it is funny you, at times. You were also called upon to do a lot in the way of some volunteer kind of thing. Oh, yes, and crowning queens, and no queen wants to be crowned by a woman, you know. I'd have to do that for my husband sometime. But volunteer work I've done all my life because I believe that our society is what it is because keep people <laughs> care enough to overflow yeah. with their love. The more you give away, the more you have, and yeah. that your life becomes meaningful when you work for a cause that's beyond you. Yeah. <laughs> You're not even a candidate's wife yet, and you're doing voluntary. Right. I understand the American Cancer Society, there's the, the uh, society right. auction. Well, you, I don't have a lot of time to volunteer, but the one thing I really uh, uh, feel strongly about is, is conquering cancer. So I've become very involved this year in uh, working to help raise money for cancer, and this week, uh, a week from this week, on October 27th at Gorman's Galleries, we'll be having a celebrity auction to raise money uh, to help conquer and fight cancer and it should be a lot of fun we have celebrities coming in from all over we've had all like kinds who, of who, donations who's coming in well we're having uh, George Plimpton coming in oh, from New York that's where you'll be moving yeah. and we have uh, uh, some the Lions we have had donations from Betty Ford at the White House Center something and hmm. Senator Griffin and the bird and well, all kinds of people. Is it should be a coming? lot of fun. The bird has not committed yet as to whether or not he's coming, but we still have some of his clothing that we can auction off. It should be a lot of fun, and we're looking forward to doing it. You ought to come if you're in town. I should do this. 7.30, October 27th. Why did the Cancer Society pick you to help out in this way, or did you pick it? Some people, some people go to certain charities because no, of personal involvement. No, I picked involvement. it. I, it was, I, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to work on something. You have to volunteer. You have to help out. You can't sit back and ask somebody else to do it. I want to see it conquered. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing my bit. Well, it is, uh, yeah, I think we all do. When you see the, the number of good and dear and you know, lovely people that right. uh, we've cancer all been, has claimed. We've all been touched. Every one of us has mm -hmm. been touched personally by cancer. And we get so impatient, I think, when we, we, see, we see some of these fantastic feats, you know, going to the moon and, and, and some, of the, some of the accomplishments in medicine. And then you wonder, why right. can't anyone you know, do something with, with uh, One cancer? other thing I'll mention quickly is that 90% of all the money collected goes directly to research, which is something that uh, very important. is very good. Well, thank you very much, Rana, thank you, Marie. Rana Romney. That's a difficult name. <laughs> you do well. And Lenore, <laughs> Lenore Romney. Uh, I do appreciate the time that you've Nice to be taken. with you. Thanks again. And uh, we want to thank our audience, and I hope that uh, you will join us again next week for uh, uh, another conversation, Woman to Woman. I'm Marie Torrey.
Each year, several outstanding women volunteers are honored for their hearts of gold. Any woman active in church, cultural, educational, or other volunteer activities is eligible. For further information and a nomination form, call the United Foundation at 965-7100. Cancer needn't be a killer. The Michigan Cancer Foundation offers free pap tests at various locations throughout the metropolitan Detroit area. Call the Michigan Cancer Foundation to find out when and where in your neighborhood.